Uh, wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for tonight's uh, wonderful program uh, organized uh, jointly by the Tewksbury Library and the Public Health Museum. I wanted to introduce tonight's uh, facilitator, uh, Alfred Demaria. He is the uh, retired medical director of the Bureau of Infectious Disease uh, for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. He's also uh, a retired uh, state epidemiologist. Uh, he currently serves as a consultant and he volunteers as the president of the board of directors for the Public Health Museum. So all nearly 100 of us who are watching live, let's give Al a big virtual round of applause and I'm gonna turn things over to Al now. Thanks so much, Al. Thank you, Robert. It's wonderful to once again do a joint program for Public Health Week with the Tewksbury Public Library. And I would encourage people to go to the Public Health Museum website for other programs we're doing this week in celebration of Public Health Week and to the Tewksbury Public Library website uh, where they have an enormous number of programs for, for all ages of readers and uh, really impressive opportunities. Uh, this evening, uh, we have a very special uh, presenter uh, who, um, I, uh, well, let me put it this way. I think uh, among all the science journalists, she has the highest, highest regard from colleagues in infectious disease, I think. And, and I think you'll find out why from her talk, but also uh, she's a journalist and science uh, public health writer. She's a senior fellow at the Center for the Study of Human Health at Emory and senior writer at Wired. But she also uh, is published in an enormous number of uh, journals and um, uh, magazines, TV, radio, uh, the New Republic, Smithsonian, the Atlantic, uh, Scientific American. I could go on, but we want to hear her and not, not all that. But I, I just want to say that it's uh, always a pleasure to be thumbing through like Scientific American and seeing her byline because, you know, it's going to be a story that's going to be interesting and relevant. She also, during the pandemic, put on a massive on a massive open online um, course, a um, mock, as they say, I guess, M-O-O-C. Uh, and, and that drew 9,000 journalists uh, to, uh, to this course on how to handle something like a pandemic, a tremendous resource. She also uh, was the only, and maybe still the only journalist assigned to the CDC full-time by the uh, Atlanta Journal Constitution. Uh, and in that role, she covered uh, the anthrax attacks, she actually embedded in the anthrax attacks, the, uh, uh, the Indian Ocean tsunami, the uh, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and, uh, in 2004, published a book about the Epidemic Intelligence Service uh, that was highly regarded. Uh, and uh, she's received a, a large number of awards, uh, one in particular from the Alliance for the Prudent Use of Antibiotics, a, local a, a locally headquartered organization that's really an international organization uh, to raise awareness of antimicrobial resistance, but also the John P. McGovern Award, uh, the Byron Maxwell Award for Excellence in Public Communication. So she, you know, she has made an enormous contribution both to public education and journalism, as well as to the profession of professional journalism. Uh, in 2010, she published Superbug, uh, which was a book about, uh, oh, it's right there. There it is, <laughs> right there. <laughs> so, so that was a little hard to say, the big chicken shows up more. Beating back the devil. Um, uh, about uh, MRSA and uh, uh, multi-drug resistant organism. And pertinent tonight, the book, Big Chicken, about the uh, story of antibiotics in, in agriculture, which you know I think is, is, is broader than many of you will think, and you'll hear about, hear about that impact. She, she graduated from Georgetown University in the Medical School of Journalism at North, Northwestern, where she received a, a Master of Science in in journalism. So I could talk a lot more, but I'm not. I'm going to stop uh, and turn it over to Marin McKenna, our speaker tonight. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, it's such a pleasure 
to be returning to Massachusetts, even if it's just virtually because I was quite a long time ago, a journalist in Massachusetts for, um, gosh, five or six years, I think, and I still miss it very much. Um, I am now in Atlanta. I'm two miles from the CDC, the easier to stalk them. Um, and as you heard from my very distinguished introducer, Dr. Damaria, thank you so, so much for that lovely introduction. Um, I cover a variety of things related to public health, but what I'm gonna talk about tonight is one particular obsession that I have. So let me share my screen with you so you can see my slides. Okay, so, the story that I'm going to tell you is the story of how we created the system that produces the meat that we eat. This is a story that I have been obsessed with for years, and it led to the book that you heard about, Big Chicken. It turns out that our modern system of producing the meat that we eat owes its existence to two things, to antibiotics and to chicken. Antibiotics are the foundation of modern meat production. Since the 1950s, I'm going to tell you this whole story, all around the world, we've fed most livestock tiny doses of antibiotics on most of the days of their lives. I'm getting a message. Oh, good. Okay. It's just a message um, in the webinar chat. We've fed animals' antibiotics on most of the days of their lives to make them grow more quickly and to protect them against the diseases that arise in crowded barns and feedlots. We do that for cattle, for pigs, for other meat animals, but we did it first with chicken. Poultry more or less taught the rest of agriculture how to misuse antibiotics. And to tell you right away, this is not only a story of doom and gloom, in some parts of the world, chicken and chicken producers are reversing that historic mistake and teaching the rest of livestock agriculture how to wean itself off of antibiotics again. So I am obsessed with this story because it contains within it so many mistakes and so many lessons. Mistakes of trusting in technology, of failing to ask questions of science, of assuming there's only one path to progress, and especially of taking things for granted. And in this story, the thing that we take the most for granted is antibiotics. There's something I think we all forget, which is that antibiotics in terms of human history are a pretty recent arrival. The antibiotic era begins depending on when you start counting, either in 1928, when Alexander Fleming first recognizes the action of penicillin, or in 1941, when that drug is given to a human being for the first time. So the antibiotic era is either 95 years old or 79 years old. Either way, one lifetime long enough that almost everyone you know was probably born after antibiotics were created, but still, as a result, we have no sense of how precious antibiotics are, how extraordinary in human history. So this is a magazine advertisement that ran in 1930 in a magazine that in the United States was as popular as modern mechanics or, or popular mechanics are now. What you can see in it is that it's an ad for Listerine, which we think of as just a mouthwash, but was originally a topical antiseptic. And the message of this ad is that if you do not take care of even minor cuts, as minor as a cut that you might get shaving, you could end up like the version of the chat on the right, at least from my point of view on the right, in an ICU. When I look at this ad, what it says to me is that we've forgotten in that one lifetime of antibiotics being available what earlier generations knew, which is that life without antibiotics, without guaranteed protection from the ravages of infection, was often tragic and always uncertain. In the time of our grandparents and our great-grandparents, surgery and childbirth and accidents routinely were fatal. 
So were random injuries and childhood illnesses, and even, as the ad shows, something as minor as cutting yourself while shaving. So we became so used so quickly to the power of antibiotics that we failed to treat them with the respect that they deserve. And we're now encountering the unintended consequences of that worldwide. The power of antibiotics is being undermined by antibiotic resistance, which the former chief medical officer of the United Kingdom called as serious a threat to society as terrorism. And the Secretary General of the United Nations called the greatest and most urgent global risk, a slow pandemic that would take out even more people than COVID has done. We're losing the power of antibiotics because by misusing them and overusing them, we've allowed the bacterial world to adapt to them. And one of the most important avenues by which we do that is agriculture. And now I'm gonna tell you the story of how that happened. So to go back to the beginning, this is Thomas Jukes. He was a British biologist who emigrated to Canada in the 1930s, worked his way across North America, taught for a while at the University of California, and in the 1940s ended up at a pharma company outside New York City. And on Christmas Day, 1948, he walked into his lab at that pharma company to check the results of an experiment. He did it himself because he'd given his lab assistant the day off for the holiday. Where he worked was a place called Letterly Laboratories, which had just filed a patent for the first tetracycline antibiotic, which was called oreomycin. We know it today as chlorotetracycline. Here's what his experiment consisted of that he was there to check. He had taken a bunch of just hatched baby chicks. He divided them into groups. He gave the different groups different dietary supplements, vitamins, cod liver oil, brewer's yeast, synthesized vitamins. Those had just come on the market a few years before. And to one group, he gave the dried, ground up leftovers of the antibiotic manufacturing that his company was doing, something that was going to be thrown away. When he weighed the chicks on that Christmas day in 1948, he discovered that the birds who had received the antibiotic leftovers had gained more weight than any other birds in the experiment, almost twice as much weight as the birds in his control group, which got just a standard chicken feed diet. Jukes called this effect growth promotion. And he realized pretty quickly, though he didn't admit to it publicly for a couple of years, that what was creating the effect was tiny doses of his company's antibiotic that had been left behind in that manufacturing waste when the manufactured drug was strained out. With that recognition, he created a new industry. Within five years, the amount of antibiotics being given to livestock just in the United States rose from zero, because no one had done this before, to almost 500,000 pounds a year, just in five years. Today, just in the United States, the amount of antibiotics given to meat animals is 24 and a half million pounds. And that's actually a lot better than we were doing just eight years ago when the total was more than 34 million. And around the world, the totals believed to be 139 million pounds of antibiotics going into livestock every year. And here's the really important point. Unlike in human medicine, almost none of these antibiotics are used to, to cure illness. They're given to animals that are not sick for Juke's effect of growth promotion, and also in something that Juke's developed just a little later to protect them from catching diseases in crowded barns and feedlots. And the reason why I stress that, that these animals are not sick, is that whenever we use an antibiotic, we're taking a risk that disease bacteria will adapt to the drug and become resistant, will develop defenses against the drug's attack, and will survive when they should have been killed. 
when we give an antibiotic to a sick human or to a sick animal, we're balancing that risk of developing resistance against the benefit of curing an infection. But when we use antibiotics when an animal is not sick, we shift that balance between risk and benefit entirely over to risk. And that's what we do when we give antibiotics routinely to animals that provide the protein that we eat. So I came to this story, as you heard, through writing other stories and writing books about the rise of antibiotic resistance. And when I was in the midst of writing my prior book, Superbug, I had so many conversations with scientists and physicians and survivors of drug-resistant infections and family members of people who did not survive. All those conversations were about the importance of antibiotics and the need to preserve them. And I was staggered to discover how freely we give antibiotics to livestock. And I went on a hunt to understand how this started. And it led me here, to the beginning of the antibiotic era. Penicillin was the first antibiotic. Its first wide use was on the battlefields of World War II. That's an ad that you're looking at from World War II. This was published in 1943. When penicillin was released, 15 years after Alexander Fleming first saw its action in a Petri dish in his lab, it was an absolute sensation. Because of its power, hundreds of thousands of soldiers and sailors came home from the battlefields of the war who would have died in earlier eras from infections from their battlefield wounds. And when penicillin was made available to civilians just a year later, people who would have died terrible, lingering deaths from infection were cured in days. Sometimes it seemed in hours. There's a reason why the earliest antibiotics were called the miracle drugs. And there were a couple of those early antibiotics. After penicillin, in just a few years come streptomycin and chloramphenicol and the tetracyclines, Jukes' company's drug, all the foundational drugs of the antibiotic era. There was enormous, crazy enthusiasm for them. It rendered them a huge public good and it also rendered them a massive moneymaker for the companies who were making the drugs that came after penicillin because penicillin itself was government supported. Manufacturers desire to squeeze just a little more profit out of these drugs happened to coincide with something very odd that went on toward the end of the war. So I think Everyone has heard of meat rationing during World War II. These are a bunch of ads supporting meat rationing from the US and the United Kingdom. The point of meat rationing was to get as much nutritious protein as possible out to the front lines to feed soldiers and sailors. But in parallel to that suppression of the market at home, during the war, the meat industry was encouraged by governments to increase its capacity, to increase its supply in order to feed troops. And it did that job as governments were paying it to do until the war ended. And then that guaranteed market went away and that left the meat industry, animal agriculture, vastly overextended with all the cost of that new infrastructure and no guaranteed way to pay for its continued upkeep. Now, some other things are going on at the same time. Because of the devastation of the war, there had been a huge amount of concern about food supplies being unstable. If you think about it, battles would have rolled over farmland, flocks and herds had been decimated, fishing fleets were co-opted by navies when navy boats were sunk, but something else was going on as well, a series of freak weather events. There were crop failures in Europe and Asia, and in the United States even, there were claims of a meat famine. That was such an important interruption in the ability to get cattle to markets, particularly on the East Coast, that it actually was a talking point, an important one, in the first election after the war in 1946. So overextended on the one hand, underprotected on the other. 
One way or another, meat producers needed to cut their costs. And to do that, they turned to giving livestock cheaper feed. Soy and cornmeal, this is actually the start of the grain economy for livestock that we hear so much about now with concerns about the, the overexpansion of soy production in the United States. So up to that point, chickens were being fed pulverized tiny fish, mostly fished off the coasts of California from the place where John Steinbeck's Cannery Row was actually set. Producers of chicken switched from fish to cereals, but cereals didn't provide all the nutrition that that fish protein had. And so they went in search of supplements to improve that new cereal diet. But because of the economic pressures, the supplements had to be as inexpensive as possible. And that's what drove Thomas Jukes into his laboratory on Christmas Day, 1948. He was engaged in that experiment, testing different supplements in baby chicks to see which of them would grow precisely because the poultry industry needed something inexpensive to add to chickens' diets. And Jukes, who was very proud of this invention and the researchers who rushed into the field right after him, were convinced they had solved this post-war problem of feeding the world. They saw no downside to the overuse of these low doses of antibiotics going now into just about every livestock animal being grown in the industrialized world. I find that really extraordinary because they would not have been doing this in a vacuum or without knowledge. Alexander Fleming, the father of penicillin, effectively the godfather of all the antibiotics that came afterward, had described this exact situation that Jukes created. In 1945, Fleming and his collaborators were given the Nobel Prize in Medicine for penicillin. And as happens when you win the Nobel Prize, you go to Scandinavia, you wear your best uh, not even a tuxedo, the fancier coat than that, and you give a speech. And most people use those speeches to thank their collaborators or their labs or their wives who probably typed their papers for them, or they praise their themselves, and Fleming did none of that. He used his speech to deliver a warning, and this is what he said. He said that if we gave low doses of antibiotics as treatments without paying attention, we would waste the power of antibiotics, bacteria would become resistant, and we would lose the power of the miracle drugs. And he was right. By 1947, just two years later, penicillin-resistant staph, staph bacteria, something penicillin resistance in bacteria had never yet existed in the world, began to show up in patients in hospitals outside London. Then it leapfrogged to Australia. Then it crossed back across the Pacific to the United States, landing on the West Coast, causing a massive epidemic in a mother and baby ward in Harborview Hospital in Seattle, which then and even now is the major public hospital there. All of these epidemics were front page news. It seems impossible to me that Jukes did not know about them, but somehow no one seems to have considered that what had caused the emergence of antibiotic-resistant bacteria in humans might also do the same thing for animals receiving the drugs as well. Because they didn't think about this, growth promotion was patented by Jukes's company licensed by the FDA in 1951, they became a routine part of the business of farming. This is an ad from an agricultural journal from the early 1960s. Um, it's actually for one of Jukes's company's competitors, Merck, still a major pharma company today, but science helps farmers bring junior, juicier drumsticks. This is about growth promotion. And in addition, once tiny doses were acceptable, slightly larger doses became acceptable as well. This is another ad from another agricultural journal. This is actually about Jukes's drug, oreomycin. This comes from about, from the early 1960s, I think. 
pharma companies figured out that if you fed animals just a little more antibiotic than a growth promotion dose, but not a big enough dose to actually cure an illness, they could protect animals from ever getting ill in the more crowded conditions that were rising on farms post-war because antibiotics were offering protection to crowding animals closer together. The FDA licensed this in 1953. And just to remind you, we don't do this in people, except in very rare circumstances, we do not give antibiotics to prevent infections. We give antibiotics to cure infections. That risk-benefit analysis, again, we land as often as we can on the side of benefit, not of risk. I was being chatted at. Okay. There were only a few people who were paying enough attention to what was going on. Oops, sorry. To warn that this might actually create illness in humans. Just as penicillin-resistant staff had never existed before in the world, penicillin-resistant foodborne illness had not either. The first signs of trouble were in dairy production. Farmers were dosing their cows so heavily with antibiotics that children who drank milk came down with penicillin allergies. And the FDA did a study that showed that in some cases, milk being sold in stores had so much penicillin in it that the milk itself could have been sold as a drug. Then cheesemakers complained that they could no longer make cheese because the amount of antibiotic in the milk they were receiving killed the beneficial bacteria that they were using to convert milk to cheese. Now that sounds a little amusing, but what happened next was not amusing at all. In different places across the landscape of the industrialized world, outbreaks of drug-resistant foodborne illness carried on meat began to appear. And this is the most serious one that actually in some ways changed the course of history. Over just a couple of months in the town of Middlesbrough in Yorkshire in the UK, 13 children died of drug resistant E. coli as a result of the meat they had been eating. So that outbreak shocked the United Kingdom and it led to the first government action anywhere to try to control farm antibiotic use. The British Parliament empowered a commission, as commissions do, they traveled up and down the country for a couple of years, they interviewed scientists and farmers and public health people and butchers and families that were bereaved, and they ended up producing a report. This is an image of it. As you can see, it has a very, very, very long title, but it's come down to us as the Swan Report after the last name of the person who was the chairman of the commission, who many years later went on to be the chairman of the British Broadcasting Corporation. What the Swan Report said was that the United Kingdom should just outlaw Jukes's growth promoters and prevent antibiotics being used in agriculture any time those, agri those antibiotics were needed for human health. Somewhat to everyone's surprise, the British Parliament actually voted this in, they approved it. And so in 1971, the United Kingdom became the first government anywhere in the world to restrict growth promoter antibiotics, routine use of antibiotics in meat animals. So from there, attention turned to the United States, which was very reasonable because growth promotion had started here, thanks to Jukes. And um, people were not of the same mind in the US as they were in the UK. In fact, we'd kind of gone all in here on the use of antibiotics in meat agriculture and in meat production. This is a story that I still find a little difficult to believe, even though I essentially found it. It was a lost episode in history. At one point when I was reporting this, I asked the FDA's archivist about this and that person had never heard of it, but Starting in the late 1950s, a process started to appear in slaughterhouses around the country. It was called acronizing. This is an ad 
from a very major women's magazine from the early 1960s produced to sell acronizing. And you can see that what it says is that chicken is going to be juicy and sweet and farm fresh. And it doesn't tell you that the reason that all of those things were happening is that newly slaughtered chicken, and in many places on the coasts, newly harvested fish as well, were being dipped in a solution of antibiotic after they had been butchered and just before they were packaged for sale. And then these antibiotic coated pieces of meat and fish were sent out to butchers and supermarkets. Acronizing was a business opportunity. It represented the drug company's successful ability to sell just one more dose of their antibiotic, the antibiotics that had been going into living animals, sold, selling that one more dose to the animals now that they were dead. Now, like a lot of things in this very complicated story, there are good intentions behind this, which is that the purpose of dipping chicken and fish in antibiotic solution was to retard the growth of spoilage bacteria on the surface of the meat. So that meant less food waste. It meant that meat or fish could sit in a cold case in a supermarket or in a butcher shop for longer before it had to be thrown away. And it also meant that it could be sent on slower, less costly means of transportation across countries or across oceans, on trains instead of planes, on trucks instead of trains, again, without being wasted. It took until slaughterhouse workers started coming up with drug-resistant skin infections for people to realize that this might have not have been a good idea. But as ex just unbelievable as the story of acronizing is to me, I also find it really interesting and really resonant for our situation with antibiotics today, because what the acronizing episode also represents is the first time in the history of meat production since the since 1906 and, and Upton Sinclair that consumers rose up and said, no, we're done. People started to write in to local newspapers, letters to the editor back when there were lots of little local newspapers around the country, saying in those letters to the editor, we don't want to buy acronized chicken anymore. We would like to see a ban. Who knows what's in our food? And these voices were so loud and so potent, even though they were disorganized and arising individually with no single consumer organization or movement behind them, that the individual small grocers that also existed in the small towns where there were individual newspapers, all of which has left our society now, they actually started to advertise that the meat they were selling was not acronized. By the mid-1960s, acronizing pretty much disappeared from the American retail landscape. And in 1968, the FDA canceled the, the, the permissions that they had allowed for acronizing to take place. So thankfully, that misuse of antibiotics was off the picture. But there is still this larger question of antibiotics being used routinely in livestock while they were still living. And it turns out that Massachusetts is really important in the story of what happens next. Thanks to this scientist, who it's possible that people who were watching may have known him. This is Dr. Stuart Levy. Um, he died in 2019, but for his entire career, just about, he was faculty at Tufts at the Medical Center in Boston. And in 1976, he was a brand new researcher, kind of looking for what his big topic was going to be. And he focused on the Swan Report in England and what was happening with antibiotics in livestock in the United States. He set up an experiment that was so beautifully done and so elegant that no one has ever bothered to replicate it. Uh, he, he found a family in Sherburne, down near Framingham, who helped him set up an experimental farm. They were a family with a lot of kids, and they happened to live on 
uh, a property that had a lot of barns and sheds on it, but no animals had ever been raised there. It had been an egg sorting business several decades before. With the family's kids and with his own grad students, Dr. Levy took over the largest barn and he built a set of locked pens so that the animals they were going to put in them would have no contact with each other. Then he went to a feed store and he bought a bunch of baby chickens. Chickens, again, are essential to this story. And they divided them among the locked pens. And then he went back to the feed store and he bought two lots of feed. One standard chicken feed, which had antibiotics in it, and another specially concocted in which antibiotics were not present. And then he hired the oldest daughter of this family to feed the birds in a particular rotation every day, going from the antibiotic-free birds to the antibiotic using birds. And the last part of her task was that every week she had to collect poop samples from all of the chickens and from her family as well. And one of Dr. Levy's assistants would drive out from Boston and collect the poop and then they would take it into the lab and analyze it. And using that poop, Dr. Levy was able to demonstrate that resistant bacteria appeared in the guts of the chickens who were being fed the antibiotic containing feed, which was not surprising. What was surprising was that the same bacteria, a drug resistant, appeared in the guts of the chickens who had not received antibiotics and who had no contact with the antibiotic receiving birds. And then after a few months, drug resistant bacteria appeared in the guts of the farm family as well. So this proved two things. First, it confirmed what people in England had assumed that routine antibiotic doses were affecting the gut bacteria, what we now call the microbiome, of the animals that were receiving them, either turning bacteria toward resistance or increasing the proportion of bacteria that were resistant. And that solved the mystery of how antibiotic resistant foodborne illness was occurring, because when animals were slaughtered, some of the contents of their guts were contaminating the meat that those animals became. And those drug resistant bacteria traveled with the meat off farms, through slaughterhouses, into kitchens, onto plates. But what was even more significant and more important now for the modern era is that Dr. Levy showed that the peril of unchecked antibiotic use in agriculture would unfold around the world in this manner. He proved that the farm animals fed antibiotics were not only a risk because of their meat, but also while they were alive, before they were slaughtered, because their gut contents, their manure, would enter a farm's environment, and the resistant bacteria that it became would begin to move through the world in a manner that was unpredictable and untrackable. And his findings convinced the US government to try to act as the UK government had. I'll remind you this is recurring, this is occurring in 1976. There may be some folks who are listening who are old enough to remember what else happened in 1976. Jimmy Carter was elected president. A complete political outsider came to DC, carting with him a whole crew of earnest young reformers who were vowing to change Washington forever. And one of the places that they wanted to affect change in was the Food and Drug Administration. And Carter's brand new FDA commissioner sent notices to all the antibiotic manufacturers selling into the agricultural market that they were going to be summoned to a hearing. And he was going to ask them to prove that there was no hazard in these drugs that they were selling for farm use. And they never got to hold that hearing because powerful congressmen who were beholden to agricultural interests, told the Carter White House that if this hearing went ahead in retaliation, they would hold hostage the entire budget of the FDA. And the Carter White House had a lot of reform plans other than this particular issue of antibiotic use. And so they let it go. And antibiotic use in livestock in the United States entered essentially a, a frozen stalemate that would last for four full decades. And at that point, antibiotic use in livestock diverged between the US and Britain and the European Union and the rest of the industrialized world. 
after the Swan Report caused Britain to ban growth promoters, Scandinavian countries came next in the mid 80s, then the rest of Europe, first in 1999 with a partial ban and then with a total ban in 2005. And in the US, we proceeded with empiricism, which is basically a policy that says, let's try it, what's the worst that could happen? And what happened was uh, in 1987, hundreds of people in California fell ill as a result of eating meat that had previously been dairy cattle at the end of their lives, that had been dosed with antibiotics to get them through a couple more breeding cycles. In the 1990s, thousands of Americans developed infections from drug-resistant salmonella, resistant to a new category of antibiotics called fluoroquinolones. Starting in 2001, researchers in California and Minnesota demonstrated that some portion of the millions of urinary tract infections that occur in the US each year were due to drug-resistant bacteria traveling on poultry meat. And in the 2010s, researchers in several places across the US demonstrated that resistant bacteria move away from farms in dust, on farm workers' clothing, on their skin, and affect adults and children that live near large farms, whether they work on those farms or not. Just in 2014, this is a map drawn up by the CDC. 638 Americans, probably thousands more that were never identified, were made sick in 30 states and territories with drug-resistant salmonella that originated in a single California poultry processing plant. The CDC estimates that for every case of drug-resistant, uh, of foodborne illness, sorry, that of any type of foodborne illness that is uh, discovered by a physician, analyzed by a lab, registered with public health, there's a multiplier of possibly up to 30 or 40 that are never identified. So this map represents possibly 20,000 Americans made sick with drug-resistant foodborne illness caused by antibiotic use in the food system just from a single processing plant. The only thing that's extraordinary about this outbreak is that it was analyzed as thoroughly as it was. And it's not unique to the US. In 2015, researchers from the UK and from China identified a bacterium carrying a piece of DNA that rendered the bacteria resistant to an antibiotic called colistin, one of the oldest, toughest, most last resort antibiotics that exist. That resistance was present in living pigs, in pork, in markets, and in people, in hospitals. And that resistance signature, which goes by the initials MCR, has now spread effectively around the world. There's a few other things I want to say. I know I'm already running out of time. This is such a rich story. Um, it always surprises me that knowing that this was going on, why didn't we care? And it's possible that we didn't take this threat seriously, this threat of antibiotic resistance in the food supply, because we always assumed that no matter how bad resistance got, there ought to be drugs to take care of it. And that is not the case. What, what you're looking at here, I just hit the wrong, um, the wrong button on my screen and I got away from my script. Um, since the 1970s, the, the rate of new antibiotics coming to market has slowed to a crawl. There's been no, the, the last truly new antibiotic compound licensed by the FDA, not a sort of me too one that's a slight change from drugs that bacteria have already experienced, came on the market in 1983. Pharmaceutical companies have decided, and, and I can't really criticize this decision, that the 10 years and a billion dollars that they spend to bring a novel antibiotic to market can't be recouped in the time that their antibiotic remains effective. This is a chart that was drawn up in 2014 by a um, special research effort in Britain that shows that for the entire curve of time that an antibiotic it goes from its first discovery through to development and commercialization, it's only in year 23 that the company starts to recoup its costs. And in year 25, generics come along. That does not seem like a smart business bet. And as a result, 
antibiotic companies that whose names we would recognize, the legacy companies of the 20th century, have mostly dropped out of the market. And the small biotechs that are trying to take their place don't have anywhere near the capitalization that the big companies do. And so they're going broke. Sometimes they're going broke after they have gotten their drug through approval, which is usually thought to be the point at which they ought to start have money to have money flowing back to them. And yet they aren't making it. And as a result, new antibiotics to replace the ones that we are losing aren't coming on the market. Meanwhile, this is what it looks like right now. In the United States, the CDC estimates 48,500 deaths a year from antibiotic resistance. The Western Europe number is probably outdated, but it has been estimated at 25,000 deaths, 1.27 million deaths around the world every year from resistance, and a prediction of 10 million deaths a year by 2050. I want to remind us what lies behind those numbers. If we lost antibiotics, the, the things that would be in, that we'd lose first, the people who'd be imperiled are the people who already have damaged immune systems. This, this is a discussion that ought to be familiar from COVID. Cancer patients, AIDS patients, people who've had transplants, premature babies. We'd lose treatments that install foreign objects in the body, like replacement joints and pumps for insulin. We might lose the ability to do complex surgeries. But what's most troubling to me is that we'd lose our protection against risks that we're exposed to every day. Antibiotics give us a degree of comfort in our everyday lives that, again, because they have always been there, we really don't think about. But in the pre-antibiotic era, strep throat caused heart failure. Skin infections led to amputations. Giving birth in the cleanest hospitals killed almost one woman in every hundred. Pneumonia killed three children out of every 10. And we should be most worried about this because antibiotic use in agriculture is most parts of the world is not slowing down. This is a curve that was drawn up by the USDA 10 years ago now, uh, and it has proved, if anything, to be conservative. This is specifically about meat consumption in China, but it's true for most emerging economies. As the economies of emerging nations improve, people start to buy more meat. We're so hardwired in most cultures to prefer meat that economists can actually use it as a reliable signal of rising GNP. Most of the global South, the blame doesn't only go to China, has not yet set curbs on antibiotics in raising animals for food. China's already the world's largest consumer of antibiotics, and it's been predicted that by 2030, China will be giving 30% of all the antibiotics made in the world to their livestock. Some of you may have seen these stories from the past couple of months that to keep up with its internal demand for meat, China is building barns, that's a barn, not an office complex, that look, it looks like a hotel or like some massive set of offices, but it's entirely for pigs. And they are not being raised antibiotic-free. So... All of this paints a very depressing picture. I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to tell you why you shouldn't be discouraged that there actually is hope. In 2014, the chicken company Purdue Farms, which at the time was the fourth largest poultry company in America, suddenly announced that they were going to take their chicken production antibiotic free. In fact, at the point at which they said that, in a surprise press conference that they held in Washington, D.C., they'd already done more than 90% of their production, converting it to antibiotic-free. They shocked the industry, but they also forced the rest of the poultry industry to follow along behind them. And at this point, every chicken company selling poultry in America has either gone antibiotic free or at least has an antibiotic free or no raised without antibiotics or no antibiotics ever label within its brand portfolio. Some other bright points. In 2016, 
the central government in China unilaterally banned that very last resort antibiotic whose resistance signature researchers had found in pigs and pork and people. By doing that, it withdrew more than 8,000 tons of colistin, that last resort antibiotic, from its internal market. And in January 2017, in one of its very last acts in office, going out the door, the Obama administration finally engineered the removal of Jukes's growth promoters from the US market, exactly 40 years after Congress had said that nothing could be done. It broke that four decade old stalemate that followed that attempt at regulation so many decades before. And all of those changes happened for the same reason the same reason that forced acronizing off the market in 1968, which was consumer pressure. Coalitions of big buyers, medical centers, school districts, and small buyers and chefs and parents joined together to communicate to companies that they did not want to spend their dollars anymore on meat raised with routine use of antibiotics. That pressure made it safe for the US government to act and it made it safe for companies to act because it ensured them that a market was waiting for them on the far side of the decision. So at this point, major meat producers, supermarket chains, food service companies have all renounced, particularly chicken, but also some other proteins raised with routine antibiotic use, including some of the largest restaurant names on the planet. In fact, last December, in an annual report, the FDA said that poultry now accounts for only 3% of all of the antibiotics sold for use in livestock in the U.S., even though in poundage, poultry is by far the meat that we eat the most. 11% of antibiotics are going to turkeys, 41% to cattle, 42% for hogs. Those are more complicated animals, and it's going to take longer to reform them. This is all so encouraging and it reverses that long, sad history, but the problem is not yet solved. Farm antibiotic control that nations have achieved in Western Europe, in the UK, in the US, finally catching up, covers only Jukes' growth promoters, not preventive dosing. There are only a handful of countries in the world that fully control farm antibiotic use. And most, including still here in the United States in some settings, continue to allow preventive use of antibiotics in animals that are not sick. So this is a problem that has not yet been solved. It hasn't gone away. And because it hasn't gone away, we can still assume that resistant bacteria are moving across the world we can't pretend that our borders protect us from them. Another lesson that COVID should have taught us. In 1957, there was significant concern about the vertical consolidation of poultry companies and a bunch of poultry producers were hauled up in front of Congress to answer for it. And one of the most powerful, Henry Salio, who was a chicken breeder said this to the House of Representatives. I think that any industry producing meat for almost the price of bread has gotten a good, has, has got a big future. That temptation to place profit first has not left us. It continues to be a significant pressure on the market. And until we change our attitude to antibiotics in the food system forever, the danger will remain with us as well. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you very much, Marion. You know, I, it's always great to be educated by a great storyteller as well. And I should have mentioned that in my introduction as well. And I want to uh, recognize and appreciate Scott Tropy for arranging for your for this program tonight and your appearance. And thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. And I, I have some questions here I want to start going through. Actually, uh, let's start with this one. Are antibiotics used in farming vegetables and fruits? Because I think that's an interesting answer for that. Um, so the answer is, it's getting dark where I am. I'm going to turn the lights up just a little bit. Okay. Um, so uh, produce, fruit, fruit and vegetable production are not innocent here. Uh, a really great example 
is that there is a profound disease affecting citrus production, particularly in Florida, and there's concern that it's going to move to California as well. The name of the, the problem in English is citrus greening, and it is a, an existential threat to the citrus industry. The EPA has allowed citrus producers to spray their groves with tons and tons and tons of antibiotics that are also used in human medicine, primarily streptomycin. That decision is now just about two years old, I think. And there's really significant concern that that broadcasting of antibiotics just in mist, just being sprayed on trees, um, is going to exert pressure on bacteria in the environment, which Stuart Levy showed us is a very important consideration, um, to turn toward resistance. And while um, a variety of organizations have been pushing to get the EPA to reverse this to this point, the economic pressure exerted by the citrus industry has managed to outweigh the public health concerns. And there's a, there's several questions that are related. And that so so what should we do? Are, are there ways of determining if uh, if the chicken you're purchasing has been produced without antibiotics? How do you is there a source a resource to get that information? And and uh, what should you do about uh, eating chicken. So um, this is the point at which I, I say that I myself am a meat eater. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to pursue this project and, and write this book was I wanted to understand the ecosystem within which my food was being raised and it did not make me a vegetarian. Um, I think there is no solution to this uh, long term other than continued consumer pressure. I mean, at this point, I can't even estimate the thousands of people who have gone up to the customer service counters of their supermarkets and said, I want you to change your brand portfolio. I want to be able to buy something that's safe. And that's in addition, of course, to the big buyers like the University of California Health System and the Chicago Public Schools, who also refused to buy meat raised with routine antibiotic use. Um, the varying labels that, that companies use are raised without antibiotics, RWA. No antibiotics ever, NAE. I think that's what Purdue uses. Um, there is a USDA label, USDA process verified. Um, now, none of these are 100%. Um, they're not all legally defined. There are additional certifications that are available to organic and regenerative producers who by definition cannot use antibiotics. Um, uh, animal welfare approved, certified humane. Um, there are certain uh, uh, chains and merchants that refuse to buy uh, antibi meat raised with routine antibiotic use. I'm pretty sure that Whole Foods is still that, um, that's still the case for them. It may no longer be domestically produced because since they're part of Amazon, they've changed their buying structure. Um, but there are really big, uh, big, um, retail outlets that have gotten on board with this as, as were listed in some of those the slides that I showed earlier. Um, there is no substitute for asking questions about where your food comes from, from whoever you can ask, from the customer service lines on, on, on the back of the label, from the customer service desks in the store. Frank, uh, um, Jim Purdue, the, the chairman of Purdue, uh, told me that at the point at which they decided to make their announcement, they were getting 3,000 comments a month from customers asking why they were still using antibiotics and wasn't it time for them to change. And uh, there's a question about what can individual scientists uh, do? Uh, and uh, I, you know, it comes to me they could join APUA, but would you have any other suggestions for them? So, what can individual scientists do? Well, um, if they're not themselves working in, in antibiotic discovery or development, um, they could certainly help with the effort to change the way that antibiotics are produced in the United States. As I mentioned, the big companies all backed away and the small companies are failing under economic pressure. There have been several different proposals to, to 
attempt to change that financial landscape, the one that ha has the broadest support is something called the Pasteur Act, named for the French microbiologist, but also Pasteur is, a, is an acronym for a very long title. What it would do is change reimbursement for antibiotic use in hospitals and healthcare, such that it would funnel some income back to the companies. Now, it's very politically difficult because it's very hard to say in the United States right now, oh, we should give more money to pharma companies. The fact is, though, that antibiotics are not like the rest of pharma. They are mostly not produced by large companies anymore. They are produced by these tiny biotechs who can't get, aren't getting public funding and aren't getting VC funding either. And they are a category of drug that is absolutely crucial to the structure of our society. Um, so it seems appropriate to me to evaluate financial remedies that would not be available to the rest of the, um, the field of pharma. The Pasteur Act fell out of Congress in the lame duck session. It's going to be reintroduced this spring. Um, it'll have you know another two years to try. And it's something that, that I think a lot of medical associations and public health associations have backed. And it's really worth um, people taking a good look at it. There's a lot of questions about um, organic. Could you comment on organic food, fruits, vegetables, meat? Uh, and if the, does that mean there's no antibiotic exposure in those products? So um, if if animals are being raised organically, and and or there is an organic certification in the United States. Um, then by, by definition, they, they should not receive antibiotics. If they are in fact sick, um, then they can be they can be treated. This is not something that that you know in, endorses animal suffering, but they then they then have to be removed from the herd or flock. They can't be be sold as an organic animal. Um, regenerative agriculture, to my knowledge, does not, which is sort of the step beyond organic. Um, to this point does not have an official certification, though there are third party certifications arising. So I completely endorse um, organic or regenerative animal protein to the degree that people can afford it. The problem is that, again, as Stuart Levy showed back in the 1970s, the use of antibiotics in farm animals creates resistant bacteria that move through the environment in untracked ways. It's very clear in multiple um, studies that there are bacteria with drug resistant signatures that show up in people that clearly can be tracked back to antibiotic use on farms. So you don't have to be a consumer of meat that was raised with routine use of antibiotics to potentially suffer from those. And in addition, drug resistant bacteria show up from time to time in produce. Um, the most notable case is, if, if I think this is still the largest, is a massive outbreak in spinach um, originating in the California, Arizona border area. That was from contamination of water sources from animals that were not very far away. Actually, in the case of the romaine lettuce outbreak a year or two ago, there was a feedlot just across the road from a major lettuce field. So as long as we are encouraging the emergence of drug resistant bacteria in livestock because of routine antibiotic use, the risk that that bacteria is going to pervade the environment and pollute essentially other food sources can't be discounted. Yeah, you know, uh, there's a question about kids in, in the farming world and what are they hearing at 4-H at club meetings at future farmers? of America, what's what's going on in terms of the next generation? So um, I actually have a, an acquaintance who wrote an entire book on 4-H. <laughs> and I, should, I, I did not anticipate this question. I should have reread it. Um, I think there's a huge amount of, uh, of awareness in among young people in food production and in food producing families right now. I mean, I, I have spent over the past 10 years a lot of time on farms, um, including in chicken farms, including in conventional chicken farms and on farms raising other species of meat animals as well. And I think that um, the, whether people believe in this or not as a phenomenon, the reality is that this is what the market wants to see. The, the, the meat market 
as a whole in America didn't turn on a dime because um, they suddenly thought it was just a good thing to do because of corporate social responsibility. They did it because consumers were telling them that was where they wanted to spend their money. Um, and I think that people who are coming up uh, in, in animal production in, you know, in the younger generation, the youngest generation of people achieving adulthood now has significantly different social attitudes to people who were raised 50, 60, 70 years ago. And I think that's true for farming practices as well. But even if it, that were not the case, the pressure of the market to do things differently is there. You, you spoke about the pressure from pharma in the 70s to prevent reform. Where, where are they now? Where, where's big pharma now in terms of antibiotics and agriculture? So when the FDA, um, when, when the Obama administration announced the, the change that it finally made in 2017, it actually announced it in 2014 and gave the companies selling into the antibiotic market a couple of years to get on board, that the technicalities of the change were that they didn't exactly ban growth promoters, what they did was make it no longer legal to label a drug as a growth promoter. Um, so it was a, an FDA regulatory change rather than a legislative change, which kept Congress from interfering. And just about every, um, I think at the, if I remember the numbers correctly, I hope I am, I think there were 27 pharma companies selling into the agricultural market selling antibiotics into the agricultural market into the U.S. And, and 26 of them fell in line and one withdrew from the U.S. market. So they, they went along with the reform. The, um, let me see. Um, well, one question is, where is your book available for purchase? I think pretty much in any book. Well, thank you so much. You, you can see it behind right. me. It's got a big chicken on it. Um, uh, all my books, just in case. Uh, so, um, uh, Big Chicken has been out a couple of years now. Um, uh, it may be um, still uh, available in hardback. Most places can you can order it. Um, in some uh, places, it will show up as plucked. You can't actually see that on my bookshelves. It's a little out of the the screen, but plucked. Uh, some paperback editions were renamed plucked, um, and that would be with a date of 2018. Uh, I encourage people as much as possible to support their local bookstores. So the site um, bookshop.org will allow you to order from local bookstores and the site indiebound, I-N-D-I-E, bound.org will tell you where your local brick and mortar bookstores are. Either of those are worth a check. And of course there's Amazon too. And we have, in addition to... Uh many questions. We have many rave reviews for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, maybe uh, we can do one more question. A lot of questions are very related, so I'm, I'm trying to not go over the same territory. Um, It's much easier when there aren't so many questions. It's, but it's much better to have many questions. Yeah, I, I think I think we've covered the ground and and uh it's, it was really a wonderful presentation. I really thank you for for your contribution to the Tewksbury Public Library, the Public Health Museum, and our public health week. Um, I was thrilled to do it. And thanks for having such a uh, a very engaged and active audience. Um, it was really a pleasure to to be watching all the, the comments. I was trying to focus on my script and on my slides, but it was hard to avoid that people were chatting in, in the sidebar. And it's always so exciting to, to know that people are listening and responding. So thank you for that opportunity. And, and I'd like to, Robert, I'd like to thank the Tewksbury Public Library again. And Scott Tropy, who's a member of our Public Health Museum board, and uh, and uh, just once again, thanks.
Marin. Yeah, thank you to Marin for a wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you, Al, for facilitating. And Al, I should have done a better job um, keeping on track of those Q and A's. I know we had like 25 questions there, um, but you did great. And Scott, uh, thank you so much for organizing. So I wanna uh, thank everyone for watching. Look for an email from me later tonight with a recording, uh, feedback survey, and information about some other upcoming virtual programs. So thank you all so, so much. Happy National Public Health Week, and I hope everyone has a great night. Bye-bye.